Thanks for tuning in to the Replatform podcast sponsored by Amplian and Clavio. You're listening to myself, James Gerd, and my co-host, Paul Rogers. Good morning, mate. Good. How are you? How are you doing? Yeah, well, um, I'm much colder than you because you're over in Dubai. You've been there for the Grand Prix. How's it been? Yeah, really good. Although, uh, yeah, I'm quite cold at the moment because the yeah, aircon's pretty cold in the hotel room that I'm doing this from, but I won't be in about 45 minutes. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm I'm not going to weep for you too much, mate, because it's freezing in the UK at the moment, as you well know. So enjoy the sunshine while it lasts. Yeah, I've only got another day. So, uh, yeah, I'll be back in a couple of... I'll be straight back to it after this. Cool. Well, let's um, let's record an exciting episode from the uh, freezing cold AC rooms of Dubai. Um, welcome back to our regular listeners. Thanks for tuning in. And if this is the first time to do the podcast, we hope you enjoy it. Uh, if you subscribe, you get new episode alerts. You can subscribe on our website and we'd love a like on YouTube, Spotify or Apple because that massively helps us with our visibility and ratings. Thank you. So our topic today is when do you need a CMS instead of a native e-commerce platform page build and how do you how do you evaluate these systems? So content features highly in most e-commerce platform RFPs, especially um, with brands who are kind of experience uh, and content driven, looking to focus on the overall customer experience, not just commerce capability. Vendors talk about page builders, but businesses are thinking about content management. So the language isn't always tied up. And sometimes what people think of when a vendor says a page builder is very different to what the modern page builders can actually do. And sometimes people can overlook actually what they can get out of an existing system. So we want to look at use cases when a specialist content management system or digital experience platform might be required because the native page builder can't really satisfy business needs. So we're going to talk about uh, when does a page builder suffice? So when can you get away of not having to spend extra on licensing and integration costs? What can't page builders do that specialist content management and, and, and DXPs, digital experience platforms, do? And how do you meaningfully evaluate third-party CMSs? Um, so, Paul, do you want to put a bit of a bit of context on this, on, on where where we've come from in e-commerce with CMS and, and where we're at now? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think, um, as you said, it's still like a really broad kind of space and i think there's low there's kind of like different ends of the spectrum as well so you've got you know the likes of big commerce salesforce magento shopify they've all got, got kind of page building solutions um of differing um kind of native capability so you know some have just got relatively basic kind of ability to drop a banner in overlay text etc cetera, etc cetera. and then um you know shopify's now built out sections everywhere which is quite broad across the shopify platform um you you then and you know yeah salesforce and magento have the same i think magento's um historically yeah, i've customized it quite a bit on build so there's quite a lot you can do with it so dependent on the platform you've got differing kind of yeah flexibility native um uh features etc um and then you've got some other platforms like i know you've worked quite a bit with optimizely or uh, epi server as it's called before and i know they're a lot broader um and then there's plenty of other platforms on the market that have invested in this area um but then you have you know the kind of add-on paid builder solutions that are maybe like still a step away from a content management system like maybe you know a z mags for actually kind of building out content or a shogun um which integrates with i think all four of those platforms um and kind of yeah just gives you a little bit more kind of flexibility around content and allows you to maybe use things like version control etc so it's kind of like a step towards the content management uh platform um and then at the other end you have then you have the likes of kind of bloom reach and ampliance which are kind of more headless cms solutions but uh you see them a lot nowadays and i would say uh that's probably like they're probably the two that i see um at kind of the with the type of brand that i'm working with where someone might really push the native capabilities of the platform then they start looking at that and then you have the likes of you know aem and some of the other kind of really enterprise uh dxp solutions um which are a bit broader again um so yes that would be my kind of summary of it and then i think the majority of our clients would use the native page builder capabilities of the platforms um i think particularly big commerce in Shopify, um, pretty strong overall. Um, you know, Shopify's come a long way since they released uh, sections everywhere. And, you know, that was always one of the biggest limitations of the platform. Um, yeah, Magento's page builder is pretty good overall. Like, yeah, we've had clients build out some pretty good landing pages and kind of use it pretty well to build out things like curated PLPs and all of that kind of stuff. Again, pretty flexible, but um, 
I guess the big one is when you do start to need things like version control, things like, yeah, um, you know, approval layers, things like uh, proper scheduling of content. That's probably the biggest one, actually, that I see people uh, complain about with Shopify is like a proper, you know, uh, content scheduling solution that allows for, you know, multiple versions, allows for like multi-store publishing, et cetera, all of that kind of stuff. But yeah, there's various other things I think people would probably want beyond the native capabilities yeah and it's interesting because in the magento space you're right a lot of businesses i've worked with page builders suffice because they don't have complex content requirements they just need to be able to publish content and do it without additional development resource but there are some agencies like tom and co have built their own cms on top of magento and they've got a headless setup and that cms has a bit of extra capability in it than the standard page builders such as the versioning and the the publishing um, piece, but it doesn't go as far as a, as an enterprise CMS and DXP. Quickly before we start into the questions, actually, because there might be some people who are newer to this area than others, and the terminology like DXP is what the hell does this mean? Can you just very succinctly for them differentiate what what is the key difference between a digital experience platform and a CMS? What does it do that a CMS on its own doesn't? Good question. So yeah, DXP stands for Digital Experience Platform. Um, I think typically, I personally would expect a DXP to have broader capabilities than just content management. So the majority of them offer some level of personalization uh, or like multiple levels of personalization. So content personalization, um, things like the majority of them seem to offer A-B te- uh, testing and diff- or maybe different levels of testing. And then kind of all of the features you'd expect from a content management platform as well around yeah things like versioning things like yeah content uh previewing um yeah scheduling all of that kind of stuff yeah i think that's a, that a nice distinction and also they tend to have better data analytics and reporting capabilities so you can get a, a bit smarter insights out of what's happening on the content usage um cool so with that in mind now let's start let's start answering some of those questions right so when is a page builder good enough so if i'll just kick off and then you can you can add your your views so for me a when a page builder is good enough is is basically the starting point for me is do you need to spend on licensing for a third-party cms or not because if you get a special cms you're adding that on top of your um, e-commerce platform licensing you've got to be sure you can monetize that investment so you've got to start with, let's go on the premise that page builder is good enough for phase one, and potentially we need to evolve into a special CMS or DXP later on. Because special CMSs can cost you know 20k plus per annum, you know, for big sites, um, you know, where you've got multiple storefronts, you've got a lot of content pages, it's 100 k plus. <laughs> a lot of teams just want a strong visual drag and drop editor interface where they don't have to go to a developer to change the page layout. They can go in, move content layouts about from predefined components in a predefined template. Um, They can remove a component, replace it with another one. They can get the view to tell the story they want on that page. They can create a new landing page from an existing template and drag in all of the relevant components they've got from their component library. They can then put, they can edit into that. They can edit the text, the imagery, the call to action, the hyperlinks, and then publish that. For a lot of businesses, that suffices. And then the next step is on top of that, from a content page like your homepage or a campaign landing page, it's inserting those existing uh, content layouts and components into commerce pages. So as Paul alluded to earlier on your PLP, you might want a, uh, a carousel above the product grid. You might want to add a review layout um, below the product grid. You might want to insert hero content within the product grid. Uh, you know, on a PDP, you might want to, on top of your product recommendations that sit underneath your core product data, you might want to add some UGC, for example. So a lot of the modern page builders, you can do this within them. You just need to set them up correctly from the start. So my starting point is, uh, you know, look at what you can get. Can you satisfy your core content objectives without spending that extra money? Um, what's your take on it, mate? Yeah, I think one of the things that you touched on that I think is always really important is um, like the compatibility or like ability to use all of the native functionality within a platform. Because I think one of the things that I've seen when people take content management out of the platform and introduce another solution is that although you end up with more functionality, um, you do lose 
uh the ability to make use of new features or kind of you know if a platform's got native product recommendations and you want to be able to use that or um yeah kind of any other content that you've got within the platform and the other thing is you know as soon as you start wanting to do anything outside of the norm you need a developer um and i guess i'm thinking of this in the context of shopify but it'll apply and you know magento is another good example actually because i think page builder and magento can actually be good you probably need to do quite a bit of development work up front to get it to where you want it to be um but i do think it can be and it's also typically used in a more kind of like when what you described there around content and using it within a plp or any other kind of like um ecom template um page builders yeah i guess does that natively um but i think that that's probably my biggest thing is i think you just lose a lot of functionality and even little things like you know if you want to take uh, a nosto block and build that into um uh, a shopify uh recommend or a shopify section um things like that it's always just a lot trickier when you've got a third party CMS or a headless CMS or something like that. Maybe that's not the best example actually. Um, but yeah, that I that's one of the things that I think is a con for separating the two out that you just lose yeah. certain native functionality and reporting might be another one. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because in integrating a CMS brings added complexity and there's performance challenges. And yes, the modern CMSs are built up to to be super speedy, like you know, the, the, the cloud service they provide, the scalability is amazing. But if the if the integration piece into the commerce and the commerce engine and the way that that then um, brings that that information through and renders it causes a performance issue, you've got to unpick that and make sure that's working. So I think that's something that that sometimes businesses don't appreciate, and it ends up costing them a little bit more in the implementation phase. The other uh, the other thing is is yeah, as you said, the native page builders, so the likes of big commerces, um, Shopify and Shopware as well. I think is really nice with its customer experiences. Shopware's always been historically ahead of the other comparable SaaS platforms with its content management native capability. But they can do a lot of stuff in there. So we talked about custom templates and components. I've worked on a Magento implementation for an equestrian brand where we had some really cool layouts with some dynamic content with hotspotting, enabling uh, linked into the native functionality like quick buy, really neat, lovely layouts, visually beautiful as well. So you can achieve quite a lot if you spec out what you want your components to do and you get the logic built correctly from the start. You can also make you know deliver mobile responsive design. So you build your components to work across your breakpoints. Um, you can build the component logic to function as it required. You might have a, yeah, a content block, which is um, a heading, a paragraphs and a call to action with an image to the right on desktop. But you can then change the logic to flip it so the image goes on the left because you want to have different layers. So there are, you can get a lot of flexibility out of it, even where you can remove the heading or you can remove the call to action button, but still you're not you're not adding code, you're just changing the configurable properties of it. You can restrict access by user permissions. So you can control who has access to the CMS out of all of the users on the platform. They don't have to have access to the entire e-commerce platform. Um, some of them do schedule publishing on a basic level. You can't, um, I've not seen them where you can schedule uh, effectively um, uh, internationally across multiple storefronts without having to go and set, set up each published schedule separate at storefront level, unless you're using a third party. You can do live preview of content and browsers. You can insert HTML into page templates as content blocks. Um, you can add content to commerce pages. I've seen this done well on on things like um, basket pages where people put USPs or reassurance messaging. Uh, we talked about hero content in product grids. Um, jewelry and fashion brands did this really nicely on, on platforms like Big Commerce, Shopify, um, Magento. You can set core SEO properties. Um, yeah, for example, control image image um, titles and tags when you upload it. Um, what else can you do? You can look at the edit history on some of them. You can make content visible or not visible on specific stores. If you have a banner that you only want visible on on you know UK store, not on US, you can control that. So I think there's a lot you can do in a page builder. So the question as a business is, okay, let's be very clear. Have we been seduced by the marketing of of what an amazing enterprise CMS does? But have we have we actually compared that back to what do we really need in order to operate? And what do we need over the next 12 to 18 months? Is there really an exception where we can't function as a business and achieve our, our content goals for e-commerce without that added third party? The um, the only thing that I'd add that's actually quite interesting is uh, uh, so Magento on paper is actually very good uh, natively. So I think uh, you know page builders 
good flexible like you gave some good examples there where it's actually a, quite a bit more flexible than something like a shop buy around like you know uh, things like mobile and how you adapt content etc you can use it uh, with some of the other native functionalities so you know customer segmentation customer groups etc so you can do a lot of it but one of the things that i think is quite interesting when you're like assessing capabilities is yeah like the intuitiveness and how easy it is to do some of this stuff and and i guess like you say how much development work you might need to actually get the most out of even the native stuff um because yeah i still think although magento is actually pretty strong if you run an rfp and you had a list of requirements i actually think you know the native capability is actually pretty good but uh, yeah they don't always yeah work as well as they might look like they work if that makes sense yeah, it does. And it's a really good point. And it leads really nicely onto the next question, which is what can an enterprise CMS do that the page builder can't? And and actually, one of the benefits is often that the these um, specialist CMS, CMSs, whether it's just a standalone CMS or a CMS as part of a DXP provider, is that they tend to have richer libraries reference um components logics um things that you that already exist that a developer could very quickly spin up the um content layouts that you need and the templates that you need rather than having to do like fresh coding from scratch so you're right the although you're paying a license fee you you are often saving in development upfront costs to get things set up to deliver against the business content needs so that's a really really important distinction for people to think about you've got to always assess within your build phase how much um, costs and effort for the developers to deliver against your content needs um, and then the other thing linked to that and then I'll hand over to you is automated publishing and you touched on this earlier so a lot most of the page builders you can you can set schedule publishing say okay I want to publish this new homepage layout to my home to my UK homepage on Thursday at 12 p.m but what you can't do is automated publishing from like staging environments to production you're basically live editing. And for a lot of businesses, you know, live editing in production with preview and then publish or save in drafts is fine. But for others, they're working on so many campaigns concurrently that they don't want to do that in a live production environment. That brings with it risk. And it also is, is much harder for the business to control the workflow. So they want a true staging environment. They want to have a tool that's capable of automatically publishing that up into production at the required time so they don't have to then manually recreate everything in the production environment. So that's my, I guess that's a good intro for me. Well, hand over to you. What, what, what have you seen? What can enterprise CMSs do that page builders can't? What is Ampliance? In a word, it's freedom. The freedom to build a digital experience as limitless as your vision. Create, preview, schedule, and manage all your content in one easy place. Find out more at Ampliance.com. Ampliance. Experience freedom. Yeah, um, absolutely. One thing I was going to add to your thing that's quite interesting is um, that's probably one of the biggest um, uh, kind of pushback areas that I see from people. So we've had a couple of clients that move from Salesforce to Shopify and the internal teams just cannot get their head around not having a proper staging environment, not being able to truly stage content um yeah not being able to truly kind of schedule everything they're doing etc um so yeah that's an interesting one maybe that could be another episode like kind of battling some of those conversations or like yeah kind of storytelling a little bit um so that makes sense so i think the biggest if i think about the biggest reason why i've seen clients move to these solutions um i guess one is like overall flexibility maybe people are looking to invest in you know editorial or just like really unique content as a brand and they don't feel like the platform uh, as page builder kind of allows them to do that um, or so the biggest one usually for me is like someone's been kind of maybe sold the dream of doing true personalization and being able to, you know, essentially serve completely different customer journeys to different groups of customers, um, maybe based on, you know, their affinities with different product categories or their behavior as a customer um, over, you know, their lifetime. Um, and it feels like for me, particularly when you get the uh, kind of CMS or DM 
DS, DXPs that are also connected to the CRM, that's usually like the holy grail that people are trying to achieve. And I haven't seen too many people actually achieve it, but um, I think that's usually what uh, people want. But yeah, I mean, on paper, I think a lot of these platforms have some level of capability where they can provide different experiences for different types of customers. Um, and like I said, I think a lot of our clients have ended up doing that in a relatively basic form. But um, yeah, that's something that these platforms would be stronger than the kind of native capabilities of a platform, even where, you know, some platforms do have that natively. Um, I think on top of that, one of the other reasons we've seen people take this out of the platform. So again, going back to more like a Shopify example, but is uh, basically trying to bypass uh, and limitations of the platform. So um, we've got one client that have got two Shopify instances, and then they've essentially got 15 sites um, that are all managed via Storyblock. So um, essentially, it just looks like they've got 15 sites. They've kind of fully localized, but then they've got like a much better way of kind of managing content across those sites. And then you go into the same checkout. So they're using Shopify markets, but the content on the front end, they have a lot more flexibility around and they don't then have to have all of those different um shopify stores um and i think that's probably quite a common use case um and i've also seen it where people are almost using like a contemptful or uh, yeah um a um sanity or whatever else is like almost like a pim to be perfectly honest and like um so just trying to make the multi-store piece of shopify a lot easier um so yeah that's another really big one um and then a lot of the other ones we've talked about so proper scheduling proper uh version control um but they're probably the biggest ones that um i would expect to lead people to an enterprise or like a more um specialist cms yeah, I, I think that's a great point, actually, because we all know that no platform is 100% perfect and there are limitations of every single one and advantage of everyone. And one of the challenges around the, the international multi-storefront is whether or not you are using a true multi-storefront setup in the commerce or whether you've had to separate the storefronts because of the operational side that and how you need to make them work. And therefore, you can only do it in separate instances. And therefore, the content management is separate in the page builders for each storefront. And therefore, a, a CMS like a PIM does for the product catalog, enabling you to manage all your content in one place and schedule all the publishing. And then you're using like the APIs to push the content into the relevant storefront can save a huge amount of time and effort. And which, when we come on to like, how do you justify the investment? That's a really important discussion to have. So businesses really need to scrutinize not just the page builder capability, but how is the, what's the storefront architecture you're going to have in your new solution? Um, that the the development team, the technical teams have signed off on, and what impact does that have on you and your content production processes? Um, the other the other things that I've seen, and I know the page builders are catching up. I know, for example, you know Shopify with sections everywhere has made a massive change to this. Is the ability to create a single asset and publish it to multiple content locations in one go, rather than having to recreate it on every page you need it to appear on. So this could be, I want to draw. I've got a product category of like saddle pads. Um, for like my equestrian brand, I want to now on every PDP in saddle pads, drop content block A in uh, at the same place on that page. And I want to just publish it once. And that is it. And it automatically does it because I can set the logic. Um, with some some of the uh, page builders, you've got a bit better control now about being able to publish a content asset to different pages, but you don't have the same granularity that you get in a true CMS of being able to add logic of where and when something appears and when it doesn't and how to create exceptions to the rules and that when you're getting to a more sophisticated level of content targeting and personalization and customization of the user journey that becomes more and more important and when you're a massive um, catalog company that differentiation at category subcategory and even specific SKU range at pdps and even on the plp level which can be really important and then the other one for me would be Distributed content workflows, which I know you touch upon, you often get this in international where you might have um, a centralized content team, but localized um, content creators who are wanting to create campaign pages or create new ca um, uh, new content assets, but it has to go through approval somewhere else. And you need to have a proper workflow for someone to be able to edit, create, send it for approval, that be approved, and then either that trigger an automatic publish or it enables the content creator to then go and schedule that into the production environment. Um, you've talked about personalization, so I won't go back on that. And the other bit, actually, 
um, forgive me if, if you did and I just wasn't listening, was digital asset management. So what can you do with images when you upload? Is it just a, a some some page builders, it's very basic. You upload an image and you don't have a really effective library for managing and storing and categorizing. Um, the, the CMSs into the DXPs have much stronger digital asset management. So you can have better structuring of the folders of the images. You can have better search to find those images. So it's easier to find an asset that you want to include now in a new content layout or template. You know, they are very good at setting image presets. So, for example, you know, if you've got one main banner you upload and it needs four different formats, it automo creates those in the relevant formats. Um, they're all, you know, minimized, optimized so that they don't have performance issues. And some of the top end CMSs even enable like auto cropping. So they'll crop to the right part of an image. That becomes a much bigger challenge in certain verticals like jewelry. But um, you know, if you've got good image image um, um, shooting skills, then you can actually create images that can be cropped, auto cropped pretty smartly. Um, anything else? Anything else we think we missed in terms of where the those enterprise CMSs add value? One um, one thing that we've touched on that I think is another reason why I've seen people move content out of the platform is the editorial side. So where you get, um, I've worked with a few brands where you know ninety percent of their traffic is going to their blog, um, and then they've got a commerce aspect, um, or it's just you know a particularly content led brand, or someone wants to go to market as like a content led brand. I think the native blogs. Um, uh, within the platforms haven't been strong enough so they've ended up you know going down the headless route or introducing something to just um improve that side of things so i think that's still pretty common even though yeah some of the platforms have improved that side none of them are like i guess you know a true kind of blogging platform i have true blogging capabilities and not that most of these cmss do but they're a bit more flexibility and they're a bit more flexible in kind of getting to that point yeah, that, that's a very good addition. The Because if you just have a simple need to publish articles, page builders work brilliantly. You can publish as many articles, have a template, create it. Each article can flow slightly differently using the existing layouts, like a heading, a subheading, text blog, image, you name it. But if you want a blog where you have like indexes, archives, um, smart categorization, like auto-populating, like latest posts, most rated, all that additional functionality, yeah, you're right. That's a good distinction. Let's move on to the next question then. How do you evaluate CMS providers? So what, what's your advice to people? when you're, If you're looking at a, a specialist where you might have to incur additional license fees, how do you evaluate and know whether it's fit for purpose and the right tooling? Yeah, I think this is an interesting one because there's so many variables because you've got different solutions with different feature sets and you know sometimes you'd be getting like a you know really um you'd just be buying a headless cms sometimes you'd be buying like a set of tools that essentially power the whole front end like a shogun front end um but i guess for me i always look at uh so i'm quite like ecosystem focused i guess usually and like compatibility is like the number one thing that i would be trying to retain or like um essentially not losing too much of the core platform unless you're kind of starting off with you know something that is essentially just like a commerce engine um or you know a set of apis and it'd probably be completely different but um thinking of the types of brands that i would typically work with i guess i would want something that's well integrated that's potentially integrated with other core, like key third parties that are part of your tech stack um so something like a sanity or you know a contemptful or some of the ones that might exist within the platform ecosystem might be the first ones to look at but um that being said i think um usually one of the biggest like starting points would be like uh how maybe technical your team are and like you know something like a contempt for is super flexible and um, but you need to be semi-technical i think still to work with that platform as an admin user um or based on my experience of it anyway um so i guess that would be one of the biggest things to start with from an evaluation perspective like cost would be another one flexibility might be another one yeah like lack of like ease of use without development resource might be another one um but yeah they're probably along with like the obvious ones like native functionality around things like yeah um staging um scheduling all of that kind of stuff but they're probably my biggest yeah uh all, all sensible I, I think for me the might the process i normally take to to look at it is is that integration piece first is 
this CMS, are there existing live clients using it alongside that e-commerce platform? So if you're on big commerce and you want to work with, with Ampliance, well, we know that they there are integrations, there are live sites, same with Bloomreach is. Um, but then also it's you've got to then take a step back and say, okay, are we using this e-commerce platform in a different architectural way than this site uh, um, is currently being used in? Do, are we creating any additional complexities for the integration piece? Just make sure you're having the technical conversations with the with the CMS provider, with the platform technically, and with your developers to, to understand what the impact in build phase is. Uh, then you've got to grill the grill on the template and content creation how much dev work will be required ongoing if you want to create new components? What what resources will you need? Can you do it all yourself in house? Are you reliant on the third party? Is there any um, like technical support ongoing involved, including the license fee? So you know if you wanted to add a few more components, that would be done for you as part of the service. How extensive is the current library? Um, you know, is that is eighty percent of your content needs already solved from the existing libraries, and therefore you're de-risking it? Um, and then it's, yeah, then it's, it's following down to things like the staging and production links, how automated the content publishing flows versus how much ongoing manual effort does your team need? Um, if you want to use it properly, do you need extra resource? Are you going to have to factor that cost in and then the performance bit? So how will you measure performance? How will you know that it's not having a detrimental impact to page load times or to the user experience? You know, uh, is it a seamless um, to have content loading, are there any issues when you're adding like large video files? I know this this should be a thing of the past, but how something is integrated and implemented has a big impact, not just what the back end stack and capability of the of the platform is. So that's that. I guess that, those are the way those are the questions that I always have in my mind. So that leads me on to the final question for today, mate. What's the ROI for investing in a specialist CMS? So how do you build a business case and where have you seen businesses get a justifiable return on investment? Yeah, so I think um, two that have been most relevant for my clients. So one is the customer experience or the front end or the ability to achieve a business goal around those split customer journeys or yeah, that whole piece. So the capability for improving brand and customer experience um, and then the other one is uh saving of time for the ad or like the business users essentially i think they've been the the two and then i think yeah in terms of like justifying that it's probably just yeah essentially quantifying the hours saved or quantifying the improvement to the experience of the customer like new and existing customers yeah i i I tend to focus on the cost saving and efficiency piece as well because it it can be very hard to model out what the what the revenue impact would be because you don't know whether richer content, which is quite a nebulous term, has any fundamental impact on conversion. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's just you present your brand better and therefore, from a creative and brand point of view, the company's happy with how it's visually representing itself online. So until you've done the assessment, uh, um, you can't really 100% prove. You can do some indicative tests on existing page builders, like you know, create a couple of like new um, pages, spend a little bit of money on, on getting a, you know some some richer layouts done, and test what impact that might have. But not many people go down that route. They just change the CMS and then then see what happens afterwards. So I think it's yeah, it's removing inefficient processes, calculate the time saved. I did it with one client where we looked at I think it was about two people's effort. Two days worth of effort per um, uh, so two day, two three days per month would be saved by cutting out the manual effort working across the different stores with content creation um, uploading etc. And then you monetize that at the existing um, day rate that they, those people are on across the year and look at whether that nullifies the additional license fee because if you get cost neutral on this but you're getting better tooling you're going to have a happier team you've got more intuitive tools then any revenue benefit in the future is just a boost, but you're not losing anything. So why wouldn't you give the team a stronger set of tools to execute the plans against? Um, and then also about the ongoing like development and maintenance. If you're using a page builder, but you know that you know every time there, you know, you're on Magento and every time there's a major platform upgrade, you've got to go through that upgrade process. You've got to look at you know any backwards incompatibility there might be with with custom layouts or components you've built. You might need to tweak some of the code on that to make it compatible with the new versions. 
you, you never know. So you've got to have that factor in mind if there is additional ongoing maintenance costs, because if we're using a CMS, then all of that and the logic and the components and the performance is maintained out of their platform um, you know, at, at the back end. Uh, so we've got to make sure that we've factored into that. And, you know, it's not it's not talking about tens of thousands a year, but maybe it's a few thousand extra a year you think it's going to cost you. That can offset part of the license fee. And then the other is the SEO benefit is if you believe a CMS enables you to create deeper editorial, like you say, content, like better content hubs, better traffic, and you can execute it quicker. And that helps you indexation and drive in organic traffic. You can link a potential revenue uplift to that. One thing I was going to say as well is I think there's two other things that I just thought of. Uh, one, uh, back in the day, the dev hours piece, I think probably less so now, but historically we like probably 50% of our clients would use like a Z mags or equivalent um, to basically build richer landing pages, richer kind of brand pages um, without having to pay a development agency to build a bespoke landing page every time. And that was, you know, a huge justification of those tools, which would typically be between you know one and four grand a month depending on the size of the brand um but one thing with almost all of those is up until recently they're all javascript based so i think um they have you know a lot less benefit from an seo perspective than they would if you're building that content within a kind of inline template um so that was one thing and then the other thing that i was thinking about with some of your other points was i think typically most of our clients have signed up to the cms as part of so let's say they're moving away from sales and then moving to big commerce they wouldn't be looking at it as like the cost of the cms it would be big commerce plus an ampliance or a bloom reach let's say um and then you're still you know saving quite a lot of money on from an opex perspective over a, a sales force potentially but it's the combination of those two that allow them to like achieve their functional requirements yeah that's a nice addition looking at it is a lot of this happens when people replatform and therefore, it's the overall cost of ownership rather than the in the individual line cost of a CMS. Yeah, nice, nice addition. Um, cool. So that brings us to the end of our whistle stop tour around when do you need uh, and should justify investment in a content management system versus when can you get away of using platform page builders. We'd love to know what everyone else thinks. Um, yeah, what's your experience? When have you found use cases for a third party specialist CMS or DXP? You know, what do you rate about native page builders? Yeah, let us know. J- jump, jump online. Uh, yeah, give us a message on Twitter, LinkedIn. We'd love to hear. And thanks for listening. Keep an ear out for the next episode. We drop one every Tuesday. Do subscribe if you haven't already, and please do give us a rating on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. All right, take care, everybody. For more information on this topic, head over to replatform.fm for our audio podcasts. To discuss a project, or if you'd like to chat about any of the topics covered in this episode in more detail, please reach out to myself, James Gerd, or my co-host, Paul Rogers, via LinkedIn and Twitter. Thanks again for listening, and keep your ears peeled for the next episode.